Just uh, turn in your Bibles. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. That's everybody's favorite book. <laughs> We're going to Leviticus chapter 14. A lot of interesting things about Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus, uh, the Hebrew word for Leviticus is, is uh, the Ikra. And it comes from the first words in the um, book of Leviticus, mm -hmm. and he called. The Ikra means, and he called. And literally what happens is that Leviticus uh, just comes right on the end of Exodus, and Exodus is where they built the tabernacle, and the presence of the Lord had filled the tabernacle so completely that no one, including Moses, could enter into the Sabbath. When God fills something, he fills it so completely, nothing else can get in. That is a encouraging thing to us, because if we get so full of God, nothing else can get in. You want to win, 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 win over temptation in your life? Get full of God. The more you get full of God, the less you can get back in. There's just nothing can get back in when you get full of God. But the tabernacle is full, and then God calls from the tabernacle, he calls to Moses out from the tabernacle. I find that interesting. And then he gives Moses these directions on how to approach the throne of God, which was in the holy of holy place, which was the Ark of the Covenant. And so there was a protocol for approaching the Ark of uh, the holiness of God. And so Leviticus literally is a book telling us how to live a holy life. It is a book on holiness. In fact, the Jewish people, the interesting thing is, is that when a child goes to, is old enough to start learning, then what they do is they, the first thing that a child learns is the book of Leviticus. Isn't that interesting? The first Bible book that a child opens up in school, when they are learning about the Torah, they, are, they learn the book of Leviticus. And the theology is this. Children are pure. And pure things should be taught about pure things. I think that Christians, when you're born again, should learn how to be holy. <laughs> and Leviticus literally will teach us how to do that by looking at the principles behind what is being put here. Because, see, God had to deal with, uh, with Israel in a physical way. He had to somehow or another take spiritual truths and put them into a physical representation so they could even come, come, comprehend it because they were not spiritual beings. We lost our spiritual being in the Garden of Eden. We don't return it back until we are born again by the crossing of Calvary. And so these individuals were not able to understand spiritual things, so that so God had to put, give them give them physical things so that they could have some kind of understanding of what God wants out of them. In chapter fourteen here in Leviticus, this is very interesting. This is the law of the leper. Now, before I get into this, I gotta gotta explain something to you. Leper is a terrible translation here. It's horrible. So is all, uh, all, uh, every, all the way through the Bible, every time that you hear, see the word leper or uh, leprosy, it's a horrible translation. It would have been better to leave this word untranslated. There are some words that are better to be un left untranslated. Like hallelujah is left, best un left untranslated. We, we're so used to hallelujah, we, we don't even know what it really means. But it's not translated. It's, it's, so is amen. Amen is not translated. So, there are some words that are translated, and this one is, should have been left untranslated. Because if it leaves us, if it's untranslated, then we have to find out what it really means. Jerome, when he did the Latin Vulgate, I don't know if you're familiar with how the Bible came down to our uh, English Bible, how it came down to, to us. 
But Jerome did the Latin Vulgate. And when he came across this word here for leper and leprosy, and uh, leper in Hebrew is mitzora, and uh, leprosy is, uh, let me find it here and I'll, I'll, I'll read, read right out it. The uh, leprosy is uh, zarat. Zarat. Zadi. If you're, if you're writing down the Hebrew letters, it's uh, uh, Zadi Resh. Uh, I mean, uh, and so that's, that's, that's the word that's translated. So what he did when he saw that, he didn't know what to translate it into. So he chose this word, lepra. Lepra. That's the... And so then what happened is that when they translated it out the Latin Vulgate, they see the word lepra, which is... Which is uh, one language, another language, and they translate it into leper and leprosy. That is not what this word means. <clears throat> this word is a skin condition, and it is a it is a word that covers a multitude of skin diseases, uh, uh, skin issues, or skin uh, diseases. It may would cover such things as boils. It would cover such things as, as uh, psoriasis. It would cover such things as uh, um, uh, some kind of rash. All right? So anything that appeared upon the skin that was either blotchy, it's also, it, this also is referred to as in homes for mildew and also uh, 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 mold. And other things like that. And so the, they, they would have the same kind of a purification for a home as they would for a person. So that, that's how I know that this could not be leprosy because it's talking about a leprous home. Well, homes can't be, lep have, be leprosy. But it can have blotches. It can have defects. It can have, it can have lesions on it, all right? Like mold or mildew. So... This was a sin condition. We, we know that it well, had to be somewhat tied to something spiritual. The reason that I say that is because when Miriam was talking against uh, her brother Moses and Aaron, when she was telling them about the Ethiopian woman, God judged her and, and, and gave, her, gave her this Zaharat. And Moses asked God to heal her of it, and he said, man, he says, if, if, if she's just spit in her father's face, like you should be set up in the camp for seven days. So he said, he said, you have to be set out of the camp for seven days. So this condition would cause you to be taken and put out of the camp. This is interesting because you now are you now are far away from the presence of God. Now this disease, this zarat, uh, has a uh, has a meaning for us today, and that is uh, this represents sin. But it represents a whole plethora of sins, including what's called in the Hebrew lashon har. Uh, Hara. The Shon Hara. You know what the Shon Hara is? Evil speaking. Gossip. Talking about somebody else. That's what happened with Miriam, is she was guilty of the Shon Hara. Evil speaking against her brother Moses. And so she gets this Zahara on her body and was cast out of the out of the camp for seven days. Can you imagine now, just think, think for a minute, what it would have been like for Miriam, who is a praise and worship leader in Israel at this time. <laughs> she is a precursor to David, who's going to be the praise and worship leader of Israel later on. And she is now shut out of the camp. I think about the time when uh, Paul told somebody, he, says, he said uh, to 
to disassociate yourself from this person and cast him out from among you, so that he might, so that, uh, so that he might uh, 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 turn him over to this, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his body, so that his soul might be saved. So this was the principle: was that the body would show a destruction of some sort. But it would cause you to come to a salvation experience. It would cause you to repent of what you were doing. So it had a spiritual connotation to it. And so the, the idea that Paul had was, was not to put this person out and never speak to him again, but it was to put him out of the fellowship of the, of the congregation so he would long for that fellowship again and miss being with everybody. I can imagine Miriam being shut out of the camp, how much she must have missed all of her brothers and sisters, including Moses and Aaron, whom she talked about. And I'm sure after seven days, when she came back, she was sorry for the things she said. Because it caused separation between her and the people that she loved the most. While well, we must watch our words, Sometimes what we do is we, we tend to categorize, categorize sins, prostitution and, and, and um, burglary and murder and those, those kinds of things. And we, we, just want, we just completely ignore the fact that our words are causing us to sin. Our mouth is causing us to sin. And causing us to be separated from one another. The devil would love to get us separated from one another. That's his greatest desire, is to get the body of Christ separated from one another. And he will cause all kinds of divisions to come in and do that. <laughs> so we must always look for ways of Connecting with our brothers and sisters. Let's always look for that, those ways. So this, this law of the Zahra, the law of the Mitzorah, the leper, was interesting because when a man or a woman had these conditions on their skin, they were to be they put away. Well, let's just read, read the, the whole thing. It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the Dahara, or the Metzorah, Metzorah, in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest. And the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy is healed in the Metzorah, then so, uh, I'm going to use the leprosy because I got it in King James, but you understand what we're talking about a different thing, all right? Then shall the priest command to take him for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and watch this, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them in the living bird. In the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water, and he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. It's almost that's pretty bizarre, right? I'm sure that they had a hard time understanding what they meant. But the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. When Yeshua was crucified, they bring him vinegar and they give that to him with a hyssop branch. When the, when the soldier put a uh, spear into his side, out came water and blood. And he was crucified upon a cross. I think that when we get to heaven, we'll find out that that cross was seen. Because he fulfills everything exactly the way 
he intends it to be fulfilled. So we have cedar. We have in this. You know what? He had a scarlet. He had a scarlet robe, right? They put a scarlet robe over him. So we have scarlet. We have the hyssop, and we have all all of the crucifixion. So now I know that this is talking about something more than just two birds. So what they would do, the priest would do, is he would go out of the camp to see if the man was completely clear, cured of, of the leprosy. Because until he is, until he is clean, Let's see, Jesus doesn't go to check you out. He goes to get you free of the life. Where are we at? Yes. So, so they, so the priest then would go out to see if he's clean. Jesus went out of the camp to clean them. Isn't that interesting? We are his body on this earth. We can't wait for those that are covered in sin to come to us. We have to go and find them and heal them of their sin. That's why we're doing solar recovery. It's a way of getting out of the camp and going to the person who has the sin issue and bringing them the truth of the gospel so that they can be healed from their sin. That's what we're doing. We are the body of Christ on this earth. And there are people that need to be cleansed and they need to have the blood, the hyssop, the scarlet of life for their lives. So let's take this ceremony just a little bit further now. The priest discovers that the man is, is healed. He doesn't have the leprosy anymore. He brings him into the camp again. And they take two birds. Now here's the interesting thing about these birds. I doubt seriously that they went out and caught these birds. I believe that they raised these birds for this particular sacrifice. So these birds have always been in captivity. They were raised in cages. They were raised in captivity. They weren't raised to fly free. They were raised in captivity. They were born in captivity. It's the perfect type of you and I who are born in sin. But these birds represent the man himself and also represents Christ, and we'll show you that in just a little bit. So they take these two birds, they take one of the birds, and over running water into a earthen bowl, which is a clay bowl. <laughs> There's that clay again. There's that clay again that we, we keep, I keep talking about. And they take the bird and they cut the bird's throat and let the blood flow into the water and the, and the bowl, into the bowl. And so you get the one in water, you get the blood flowing in there. Then they take the live bird. And they take the live bird and they put him in the blood and the water. And they take the live bird out and they let the bird go free. And the bird flies away. Covered with blood. Then the priest says to the man with the Zahara, he says to the Metzara, he says, You are clean. Can you imagine the feelings that man had when he heard the words from the priest? You are clean. <laughs> Does that 
that meant that now he could go back to his family. That meant that he could go back into the presence of God. That meant that he could enjoy the fellowship of those that he loved the most. And that he wouldn't have to say, I'm clean, I'm clean, as he's walking down the street. Because now he is clean. He once was unclean, but now he's clean. He's not just covered. He is declared clean. Every once in a while I hear this statement, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's an oxymoron. How can a sinner be saved and still be a sinner? Because if you're still a sinner, then you're not saved. I was a sinner, and I am saved by grace. But I'm not a sinner anymore. God calls me a saint. He says, you're clean. Mm -hmm. You're a saint. You're a holy one. You are clean. You have been washed in the blood. You are clean. And they set the bird free. They, imagine for a moment this bird runs into another bird. In bird language, this other bird says to this other to this bird, "What's all that all over you? Oh, that's blood. What blood? Well, blood of another bird. Really? Yeah. But the amazing thing is, is that it brought cleanness to this other person." The bird says, how can I get some of that blood? So that I can bring cleanness to other people. Well, he says, I was born in captivity. But they set me free. I was born in sin. But now I'm free. Yes, <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I was held captive. But now I'm totally, completely free. I'm free to fly as high as I want to fly. I'm free to fly wherever I want to fly. I'm free to do whatever I want to do because I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Finally, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> Amen. Amen. To quote a well-known speaker, Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but but the blood of Jesus. The blood the, before the bird was let free, though, he had one other job to do. The bird had to sprinkle the Metzora. They had to sprinkle him seven times. We often think about the crucifixion as being, and it is a focal point. But Jesus shed his blood in Gethsemane. He shed his blood when they put the crown of thorns on his head. They shed, they, he shed his blood when they pulled out his beard. They should, he spread his blood when they nailed him, nailed his hands to the cross. He shed his blood when he nailed his feet to the cross. He shed his blood when they laid the stripes upon him. 
finally, and the last one is the spear in the sky. Seven times. Jesus shed his blood. Give you a moment. He's the bird. He's the bird. He's the one that died and has risen again and has went into heaven. <laughs> We have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And here are these two words. And it's interesting that Jesus did that on Passover. And we see the same thing, the blood, the hyssop, the cedar, all back in the Passover story. We have the hyssop that was taken there in the trough of the, where they would dip the blood, and then they would strike the doorpost on both sides and across the top. And I'm sure that those doorposts were made of cedar. God gave us a picture here. But here's the interesting thing. Before we got sprinkled with the blood, we were outside the covenants of God. Of God. But now that we're sprinkled with the blood, we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And we are now receivers of the covenants. Before we were outside the presence of God, now the Holy Spirit rests upon us and rests in us, and we walk in the Spirit every day of our lives. Every once in a while, I hear some worship leader, while well meaning, I'm sure, and they'll they'll either sing a song or they'll pray a prayer. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, come in, come in, Holy Spirit. <laughs> How ridiculous! Holy Spirit's here. He always never left you. He has never forsaken you. Even in your darkest moment, the Holy Ghost is still with you. Though you may not feel his presence, he is there. He was here in this building before you came, and he'll still be here when you leave, and he will go with you as you leave. When you walk into the room, the Holy Spirit walks in because the Holy Spirit is in you. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He, is, he is there with us. He's always here. You see, we don't really invite him in as if we control everything. But what we do is we say, Lord, help me to flow in your spirit today. Help me not to get in the way of what you are wanting to do today. Order my life this morning the way you want me to order it. <coughs> because just like that bird that was dipped in the blood and flew away and still had the blood all over him, everywhere you go, you had the blood all over you. There's power in the blood. You're protected by the blood. You don't have to plead the blood. You have the blood already on you. You just have to recognize that the blood is there. And remind the devil that the blood is there. But it's there all along, whether you feel it or whether you see it or whether you experience it, it's there all along. You don't have to plead and beg for it. It's there. Just like you don't have to plead and beg for the Holy Spirit, He's here. You are saturated with the blood. No evil can come nigh your dwelling. Because the blood 
so that I'll go post on your heart. You have put the blood over the doorpost of your heart. It is because we're ignorant of these things that calamity happens to us. If we understood the power that we have in the blood, it sets us free. Free to fly high above everything. Does that mean that trouble doesn't come, David? No, I didn't say trouble wouldn't come. But I'm saying that you have power over the works of the devil. You have power over sickness and disease. Somebody said, well, how are you going to die then? Well, I would just lay down my head and I would just go to sleep and would go on to meet the Lord. I would do like the patriarchs of old, just pull my legs up into the bed and just give up the ghost. I would die what they call a natural death. Paul said one time, he said, I'm kind of in, in between the straits here. I don't know whether to stay here, which is benefit for you, or to leave, which is beneficial for me. It seems to me like he always had a, a, a say-so in the decision of when to go. When you start walking close to the Lord, things start happening between you and him. Paul said there, vipers wouldn't even kill him. Shipwrecks wouldn't kill him. He was left on the road dead. The other disciples gathered around him and he comes back to life and goes back to the same cities that stole, stoned him. How does a man do that? Because he understood the power of the blood that was upon him. There's so much with these two birds. There's so much with these two birds. <clears throat> we have lost a teaching about the blood that I remember hearing over and over and over again when I was a small boy. And we don't hear that anymore. We hear sermons about people's self-esteem and that you have to have, you have to love yourself and you know you live your best life now. Those kind of messages. I'm going to give you the secret to having a good self-image. Share the truth of the Word of God with somebody else. Reach out to someone who is hurting and give them the message of hope. Your self-esteem esteem will shoot through the roof. Your self-esteem is not when you work on you. Your self-esteem is when you go and you help other people. That's the secret of a good self-esteem. Someone that goes out and meets other people's needs. And brings a truth of the gospel to other people. That's how you're going to feel good about yourself. The reason we don't feel good about ourselves is because we're not doing what we are created to do. We are created to go. God recreated us and he gave us a brand new person on the inside of us. And with that new person came the responsibility to share what has happened to us, to those around us. To tell our story about how we have been redeemed. And that doesn't stop when you get old. It doesn't stop 
when you get tired. The Great Commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that means minister and layman alike. I heard one preacher say one time, he said, well, you're all a sheep. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to reproduce. I'm the pastor. I'm not supposed to reproduce. You're supposed to go out to the streets and, and buy ways and buy ways and bring them to come into the church. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the pastor. Baloney. The pastor's a sheep, too. I understand that I have a, a, a role or a position or a, or a job as a, as a overseer, as a pastor, as a shepherd of the flock, but still, that doesn't excuse me from being a sheep myself. See, I won't be the bird that's covered with blood. that flies to other birds and tells the story about how the blood got on the earth. That's what I want to do. I hope I challenge you today to be more than just a few women. More than just intellectual giants of the world. You see, if we just are hearers of the word and not doers of the word, then we're deceiving our own selves. And I don't mean to put you under condemnation. I, I want to just challenge you. I want to exhort you. I want to encourage you. The next time that you go out, pray and ask the Holy Spirit, lead me to someone today. In my everyday walk today, Lord, lead me to someone that needs to hear this message. Give me the words to speak and let me know who it is that you're leading me to. And then just be bold enough Open your mouth and say the first word that comes out. <laughs> and watch what God does. I'm so tired of people coming in and they got all this all this this way of doing it, this way of doing it. You got the Roman road to salvation and you know that you don't need all that. Just tell them about your story. Tell them not a, a Lord, a Father, and then heaven that loves them so much. Tell them how you were taken out of the depths of hell and out of the miry pit. Tell them how you were dipped in the blood of Yeshua and set free. <laughs> That's all you have to do. It's not hard. It's not hard. When you do, you're going to see people coming into the world. When they do, you're going to have hurts and hang-ups and habits that are going to follow them right on into right on into the experience. But we have a discipling program that will help them with their hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Even will help you with your hurts, habits, and hang-ups as well. <laughs> The program actually that would be good for everyone to go through. Because we all have hurts. We've all been hurt somewhere. The people that didn't even know we've been hurt. You got hang ups. I guarantee you you got hang ups. And I guarantee you, you probably got habits. That are not necessarily good habits. You know, lethargy, lethargy is a habit. Laziness is a habit. Not sharing the gospel, you know that's a habit. <laughs> it's become habitual. 
This is going to eventually just to come to church and feel good and go home. Go about our work week and come back and go to church and feel good. Go, and go home. Go to work. Come back. Is that happening? We all need to celebrate recovery. We all need it. Everyone knows. Let's all stay. The Lord will bless you and he will keep you. The Lord will make his face to shine upon you and he will be gracious to you. The Lord will lift his countenance upon you and he will give you peace.